we're on day three, you've probably seen this before. Um, I couldn't really even tell you what that means, but um, in today's talk, there's not really any future looking comments anyway, so it's probably not too applicable. So this is the Invoke Dynamic talk. Um, gave this a few years ago at Java 1, and this is just kind of a slightly revamped um, version of, of that talk to modernize it and add a new example from JDK 9. So um, me, um, I'm, my day job is fixing hotspot bugs. Um, I do some evangelist stuff, I tweet, I blog, and I love Taco Bell. So jumping right into the agenda, we have a lot of material to try and cover in 45 minutes, so we'll kind of go at, at quite a fast pace, but uh, hopefully not, not too uncomfortable for anybody. Um, we're just gonna give some background information, talk about what dynamic typing actually means um, and, and what we need to do to support it. We're gonna talk about the Java Lang Invoke API that was added with JDK 7 and then the Invoke Dynamic instruction itself and then a whole bunch of other things that um, kind of end up in the junk drawer called other stuff towards the very end. So introduction, so today's talk is meant at specifically not compiler writers or, or not people that basically spend all their day weaving bytecode um, and might not be familiar. So, so hopefully, um, most of you are, are, are familiar with, with Java bytecode. Did, how many people here attended my bytecode crash course? Wow, okay, <laughs> so um, um, over half, I, I think. So that, that's really good, so that's a really good, good basis to make, make sense out of what you're gonna see today. But don't worry if, if you're not that comfortable with bytecode, I'm not gonna focus too heavily on it, um, but we will be looking at some Java P output. Um, in, in some of the slides. But the idea of this talk is that even if you're not like some guru that goes to the JVM Language Summit and, and lives and breathes writing compilers in your spare time, um, that you can have appreciation for what Invoke Dynamic brings to the platform and, and what kind of optimizations and, and cool stuff it allows us to do. So it's basically meant to kind of satisfy your, your curiosity. So the motivation here is that, um, as we talked about kind of during the bite the bytecode crash course is that you know Java P is a, is a really effective and, and helpful tool in troubleshooting all sorts of situations and and kind of understanding classes that you might not have the original source code for. And as we find more and more uses for Invoke Dynamic within the platform, if you don't understand Invoke Dynamic instructions and Bootstrap methods and whatnot, you're going to have a more difficult time understanding more and more of the bytecode that you see. So in order to kind of remain literate in in Java bytecode, for in a sense, you got you're going to have to add uh, invoke dynamic um, to your to your vocabulary to understand what what you're reading out of that, and also just to kind of understand that the JVM really is not just a, a great VM for Java, but for for all sorts of languages out there, and we're continuing to do all sorts of stuff to to kind of support a wider ecosystem beyond just the Java language. So the history that goes back here, there was something called the Da Vinci Project which was an idea of, of trying to broaden uh, the scope of the JVM to, to better support all sorts of other different non-Java languages. I mean, the JVM also already brings a whole bunch of really great things to the table that make it an ideal platform to kind of port things to. So, you know, you have really great performance. You have, you know, many, many, many engineer centuries of time invested in, in getting great performance out of the platform. You get portability, you get security, and you get this, this huge, ecosystem of, of pre-existing frameworks and, and open source software and everything. So wouldn't it be great to leverage that um, with your non-Java language if, if you're gonna be developing a new language or porting a language to, to a platform. You get all these advantages just out of the box. And a lot of people have obviously seen that and been attracted to that and, and created either JVM specific languages, so languages that specifically only target more or less the JVM or mainly target the JVM. And then there's of course other languages that are more general, um, but there's some really great versions that run on top of the JVM to the right. But this is just a subset. There's a, few, there's a Wikipedia page with like over 100 different language implementations. So just to make sure that we're on the same page and kind of define the terms that I'm using. so. Um, we talk about what's called a, a language runtime, which is basically just this catch-all phrase for, um, for a framework or, or a runtime that sits on top of both the JVM and the Java SE class library and, and provides the environment that's needed to run whatever other language or platform you, you're um, implementing on top of the JVM. So for example, if you're running J JRuby and you're using that to run Ruby code, the, the runtime itself utilizes I mean, just pure Java code that's obviously meant to run on the JVM, but it's also using the, the Java SE API core libraries to implement or to provide 
the, the JRuby runtime environment. So in the DaVinci project, there were, there were several ideas that people were bouncing back and forth of like, what would be good to add to the platform that would make you know, writing um, you know, and implementing languages on top of it easier, better, or more performant. And you know, there were a couple different ideas, but basically dynamic invocation was kind of the most obvious pain point. It was the one, it was at the top of everyone's wish list, wish list, so to speak. And so that's what kind of got, you know, the noisy wheel gets the grease, so to speak. So that's what ended up getting love from everybody. So before we go any further, we should really be sure we completely understand what dynamic typing is, because it, it can be more, more subtle or nuanced than sometimes people necessarily realize. And in a nutshell, we're looking at um, you know, just, just really simple code here that says, you know, we take two numbers here, A and B, and we add them together. And this alone, you know, we don't really know what any of those types are, right? Like these could be floats, these could be 64-bit um, integers, they could be signed, unsigned, you know, we don't know anything about the actual data types that are being passed into this method, and they don't need to be the same even, right? We could be passing in a float and a decimal for some example. So dynamic typing is saying that, you know, until that code is actually run somewhere, we don't know what those types are, and those types might not even be consistent throughout the, the lifetime of a particular run. They might change, so every time we call that and invoke it, we might be passing different types to it. So we have this kind of dichotomy where there's statically typed languages and dynamically typed languages, and Java is, is very much in the statically typed camp for, for almost all of its behavior. And so the, the basic difference here is that, you know, when do we check stuff? Like, like pretty much all languages can be strongly typed and, you know, they, they will make sure that you can't do something crazy. But the, the difference here is that when do we do that check? When do we make sure that you're not doing something crazy? So statically typed languages do that check. They sanity check everything during compilation time. So generally speaking, compared to dynamically typed languages, you know, when Java C actually outputs code and you don't get any errors or anything, you have a higher level of assurance that it's gonna do what you hope it is gonna do, you know, compared to a dynamic language that might say, like, like with Ruby, where it's like, hey, that method doesn't even exist, but you don't find out about that until runtime, right? So it's a much more proactive checking to that. So that, there's a trade-off there, right? Like the fact that we kind of catch all these errors early gives us a more stable platform that, that we're de developing on because we can have more guarantees about what kind of problems will not happen during runtime because we're, we're checking all this stuff in advance. But the downside of that, the trade-off here, is that this will give us these kind of false positives, meaning that there's code that conceptually would be legitimate, you know, would work and, and not have any bugs and, and run correctly, but it's not allowed by the semantics of the language because the language requires us to define all of our types up front. So it's kind of, it's more programmable, programmer flexibility versus kind of type safety and, and the guarantees we get with that. Um, so as opposed to static checking, if, if we've got something more dynamic where we're doing runtime checking, you know, we, we can do some kind of more crazy things. We can take the same chunk of code and apply it to more different situations and with different types and use it in a more generalized fashion. But then again, we, we have less guarantees that our system's not just gonna completely blow up at some point during runtime. So, and one thing to be very clear about here is that dynamic typing is not the same as type inference. Um, we've even add, you know, we've always had some marginal type inference in, in, in the language, at least since, since JDK5 and the way we handle um, generics and things like that. But um, really with the var statement that was added, um, we, we got a lot more type inference added to the language. But type inference has nothing to do with dynamic typing. Dynamic typing, again, is the difference between you know, runtime versus compile time type checking. Whereas in type inference is when you're compiling, you're asking the compiler to figure out what the types are for you. Um, so in, in either case, like you can say, yes, I'm not, it's not required of me to specify what type this is. But just because you're not specifying it doesn't mean that the compiler can't figure out for you exactly what the type of, of a particular um, data it, piece of data is. And so you want to make sure that, that you know, we, we already have type inference in Java, but you know, we don't have dynamic typing in Java. Those are, those are different things. Um, we also want to say, you know, this is different than, than weak typing. Um, there, there's, you know, kind of horrible things you can do in languages like JavaScript where this would give you like 402, 
for example, um, and, and we don't do anything crazy like that and, and don't want to. Um, so dynamically typed languages um, kind of let you, they give you more flexibility, but of course then that means that you have to wait until runtime to find out if your stuff actually works. Um, one more thing just to be very clear is that polymorphism is also not dynamic typing. So, you know, kind of like dynamic typing in, in the Java language, we can say, well, you know, if, if we're accepting an object or something, we don't know if it's that object that was declared or, you know, that class that was declared or any subclass of that. And depending on what the actual target of an invocation is, um, the link time behavior is gonna change. We're gonna get a different method that's actually executed. Um, and, and that is dynamic in a sense, but it's not the same as dynamic typing. It's not as, as flexible as dynamic typing. But, but to really understand why these are different, we have to look at what, at the bytecode level, the JVM provides for Java. So traditionally before invoke dynamic, we only had four invocation um, bytecode instructions. We had invoke static, invoke virtual, invoke interface, and invoke special. And each of these corresponded in a very direct way to the language semantics. So for example, if we have invoke static, that of course corresponds to invoking a static method. So you know, specifically we're, we're, we're calling a method and not passing a this pointer to it and we're not doing any kind of virtual lookup. So at compile time we know exactly what the implementation of a, of a particular method is that, that we're gonna call. And then invoke virtual, which is kind of the default invocation semantic for Java. Um, is also very well known to everybody and very well understood, and we're just simply calling a method that, that's not static. And the difference between the static invocation, of course, is that this time we are passing a this pointer, and we do have to do a virtual lookup where we don't know until we look at the target object that we're pointing to on the heap as to, to what actual implementation method we're, we're gonna be calling. And there's invoke interface, which for all intents and purposes is like invoke virtual, except we're calling an interface method. There, there's nothing to um, shocking about that. And then everything else kind of ends up in this invoke special, um, which is kind of like the junk drawer. It's where everything we don't really, you know, doesn't fit into the other ones um, ended up. But invoke special also is, is unique. All these seem like very different things of private um, method invocations or superclass invocations or constructors, but they actually all have the same pattern in common. The pattern here is that for all these other methods, for these three other methods, they fall into one of two camps. They have a this pointer, and they do dynamic invocation, or they, they do virtual lookup to, to determine what the method in implementation they need to call is, or there's no this pointer, and the static linking is, is being used. But invoke special is this case where there is a this pointer, but even though we have a this pointer, we still do dynamic invocation. We, we aren't looking anything up. So we know at compile time when we have invoke special, what the implementation of the method we're calling is. But um, we still have a this pointer. And if you, if you look at these examples, you can kind of see why that would make sense. So for example, if I'm doing like a, a constructor call, you know, what does a constructor do? It initializes your object. So obviously it needs a pointer to the object. It needs a this pointer so it can fill in the fields or do whatever it does to, to give your, your object back but you can't override a constructor, right? Like a constructor is, just, you know, what, what you call, when you call new, blah, 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 that's the only constructor that can get called and there's no virtual lookup going on uh, of constructors. And the same thing for when you're calling a superclass um, or when you're calling a private method, right? Private methods can't be overrided because they're, they're private. Um, so invoke special, what seems like just this kind of random collection of all sorts of different invocation use cases, they all actually have the exact same usage pattern. So what's happening here is that you see in each of these cases, there's very specific invocation behavior that is tied to the JVM or to the Java language. Um, for, for obvious reasons, the JVM was designed from the ground up to run Java. And so, for, so if you're Java, you're great because you have everything you need, um, you know, semantic wise, baked in to the instruction set um, as it is. But if, if you have an invocation model that doesn't match what we just covered, then you're kind of left out in the cold. And so your only option until invoke dynamic was to use reflection. So the reflection API is basically just out of pure necessity, kind of notoriously slow. Um, because what we're doing is we're, we're reifying a whole bunch of stuff as objects on the heap 
and then, and then you know, using various APIs to, to examine and look and, and utilize that stuff. And pretty much everything that, that we're moving around, you know, method arguments or whatever, ends up being you know, objects. They're, they're actually objects on, on, on the heap. So you have a, some method that's a caller here, and we're calling some other method through some invocation logic. And the logic there is defined by whatever language we're, we're trying to implement here. And we can implement all that fine, you know, using reflection, but it's just, just really, really, really slow. And the main reason it's slow is because we can't inline anything here because this reflection magic is, is you know, it's, it's completely up to the programmer and however they implemented it, and the JVM has no inherent understanding of, of how that works. Um, so what happens when we can't inline stuff is that basically all of our optimizations basic, become impossible. You really can't optimize code without inlining. If you don't inline code, you're just stuck. You can't even begin to optimize stuff. So, for example, um, if we look at you know code like this, where it's like if false, and you know there's there's no I guess you'd call this a fake branch or whatever. Um, you know, no one writes code like this. In fact, a lot of compilers in in the parse phase would would point this out and refuse to you know either give you a warning or maybe even refuse to compile because you must be doing something wrong if you're writing code like this. Um, or if you take in and you know you assign condition to true here, and then you you try and branch on the value of q uh, of of true here of this condition, that's also obviously nothing anyone in their right mind would write. So if you're not writing stuff like that, you know why are there optimizations that come through and, and do you know kind of dead branch elimination, um, you know where you're always taking one ver one way versus the other, and so we'll just get rid of the other one. That's a very common optimization. It's used all the time. Why does that optimization actually give us any benefit? Is because we do write code like this, where you know I'm calling method A and I'm passing it false, and and this this true or false boolean that I'm passing basically tells if method A does something optional here, right? So there's some optional stuff in here, and depending on the argument that's passed, I'll do it or I won't do it. And if I pass, you know, when I'm calling this and I pass it something, I know that, yeah, I don't want it to do any of that extra stuff. But, you know, these methods might have been compiled completely independently. These classes might have been compiled completely independently from each other. And so it's, it's up to the JVM or whatever your runtime is to look at this and go, you know, after you've inlined this into that, and then you see, oh, this is a false branch. So when the code on the right is inlined into the code on, on the left and it becomes just part of method B's implementation, then you actually see a pattern that looks to the compiler like this. And then you can go, oh, this is stupid. We don't need to do this check. And pretty much all, all optimizations almost you know, kind of depend on that. It, unless you inline a whole bunch of methods, you don't see these kind of obvious patterns fall out. So, Coming to the rescue here is JSR 292, and JSR 292 is what gives us two very important things. Everyone calls it, you know, invoke dynamic or indie, and, and that's what kind of gets the most, most mind share in terms of naming, but there's really two different parts to, to JSR 292, and they're both equally important to providing dynamic language support. So the language, the Java Lang invoke API is basically reflection on steroids. It allows you to you know, kind of codify your invocation semantics in a way that, that gets us around some of the limitations of just using reflection. But we have to tie that into um, invoke dynamic bytecode invocations, and we'll see how we do that in just a bit. So invoke dynamic is this new instruction. We call it indie for short because invoke dynamic is kind of a mouthful. And as of yet, there's still no way today um, to express it directly in the Java language itself, although it's being used more and more by all sorts of different um, you know, primitives within the Java language. And we'll see an example of that towards the very end of, of this say, uh, presentation. But you know, this is kind of, at the time at least, was, was a really big deal because for, for almost two decades, we hadn't added any new opcodes to the, the bytecode. Um, instruction set. Um, it was kind of almost set in stone. And as I, I spoke about during the bytecode crash course, you have you know 256 possible bytecodes because it's it's literally a byte, right? Your your instructions. And so the the space that we have for new instructions is very limited. So we were very careful about just you know willy nilly adding new new instructions when we can work around it by just kind of using pre existing stuff. So 
That's Invoke Dynamic. We'll see it a lot more in a few more slides. And the other piece of this puzzle is the Invoke, is the Java Lang Invoke API. And there's a whole lot to it, but basically um, we can simplify things by just kind of concentrating on three separate classes. There's method handles, there's call sites, and then there's not a class, but bootstrap methods, which are, are kind of how we tie everything together. So a method handle is basically not really allowed to say this, I think, but it's, it's a function pointer, right? <laughs> it, it's, it's pointing to some sort of implementation, some code out there, and we can use that method handle to call it. So that, that it's as simple as that. Like, so you have a method somewhere out there and a method handle will let you call that method. And you can do things like com combine invocations together and, and you know, can compose them in different ways and stuff. But in a nutshell, a method handle is just a way to call some, some functionality. And one of, the, one of the very important things here is we have it, it's got a polymorphic signature, which basically means that the JVM lets it get away with things that normal method invocations are not allowed to do. Um, what we're doing is we're basically saying that, that we're, we're gonna kind of delay, um, you know, kind of type checking in a sense when we do this and, and you know, kind of not freak out about the fact that we don't know what the arguments are or even how many arguments or anything like that. We can just kind of push that off to later during runtime. But besides that, it's really just a kind of a, a more efficient um, reflection mechanism to, to invoke methods. You can think about it that way. And it, when, it, when it first started out, especially like you know JDK seven, it was not really great in the performance department. And so a bunch of people kind of looked at it and go, oh, this is kind of some kind of like maybe sort of replacement for reflection for certain use cases. So you know, let's try and use it, and they used it, and it was like super slow, and so they just like, ooh, uh, you know, obviously I'll just stick with reflection. And then performance improved dramatically. Um, the, you know, the Lambda forms work that, that John Rose did for, for JDK 8, and then it was further evolved and, and polished in later releases, um, really made a night and day difference in the performance story for in the Java Lang invoke. And so nowadays it's, you know, even if you have nothing to do with invoke dynamic, you're not gonna use invoke dynamic. There's still use cases where um, you can come in and kind of replace um, what would have been implemented with, with the reflection API with method handles and, and see a significant speed up in your code just from that. So let's look at an exa actual example here. So we have, I, I remember I said for the, the, the java.language.invoke API, we have three main things we want to think about. We have method handles, we have call sites, and we have bootstrap methods. And so a method handle, like I said, is just a, a pointer. So here we are pointing to some function. And a call site is basically just a, a reification of an invoke dynamic call. So um, when you have an invoke dynamic, what the JVM eventually needs to do is it needs to find a call site to a, a call site object on the heap to associate with that invoke dynamic location in the code. And depending, a call site basically contains a method handle in a sense, or wraps a method handle. It holds that method handle. So if you have a call site, a call site is basically saying, when I make an invoke dynamic call from this place in the code, um, you know, it's gonna point somewhere. The method handles what tells me where it points, and the call site is how I think about it at the, at the Java language level about this, into this particular invoke dynamic invocation. So multiple call sites can have the same method handle, you know, pointing to the same function, and the same call site could have at different times during the run uh, of your code point to different functions. So it doesn't matter, it's, it's, it's kind of a many-to-many -many relationship here. So without replacing the call site, the call site is static for, sorry, I don't know how I'm messing that up. The call site is static for an individual invoke dynamic um, bytecode, but it might have different, many different method handles during its lifetime. So um, bootstrapping process is basically where we take, when, when we're first running through the bytecode in a method and we come across an invoke dynamic, um, nothing is initialized, so it doesn't actually have a call site. So what we need to do is we need to, you know, we have, we're calling something here, right? There, there's some code out there that we need to link in and call, but we don't know how to find it. And that's kind of the whole point of invoke dynamic is it's not baked into the JVM. The JVM doesn't inherently know at this point when it first starts how to actually interpret this invoke dynamic because each language has its own, 
invocation semantics and, and they can be different. So we need to give the developer the complete freedom to code it in any way they want. So the developer does that by writing what's called a bootstrap method. So bootstrap method is what gives you your call site. It basically initializes this particular invoke dynamic usage here. So each time, each location in your code that you have an invoke dynamic invocation, there's a call site that needs to be generated and associated with that location in your code so that subsequent runs through the code will actually just use the method that's pointed to by the call site. But first, when we're, we're initializing stuff, we need to, to bootstrap everything. So when, when we first run through this, we'll, the JVM will automatically call the bootstrap method. And then the bootstrap method will figure out an implementation for this particular call. Now, this might be a static implementation, like it, you know, through the entire run of, of this particular program, it might always point to this, or that might change later depending on what types are being passed or whatever. That is completely dependent on the language itself. But we know just to start, we have to have the first invocation. The first time this is called, you know, who, who out there is gonna actually you know, respond to the, this call here and, and do the work that, that the callee wants to have done, or the caller wants to have done. So the bootstrap method, creates a call site, and that call site contains a method handle which points to something. This might change in the future, but for now, it's like this is the implementation for this one. And it's up to the language runtime author to sit there and say, okay, well, if this has the potential to change in the future, like say, for example, if the, the arguments were passed might be of different types, and if, if we get a different type that we haven't gotten before, I might need to generate another method from scratch by spinning bytecode with a ZOM or something like that. Or um, you know, I might have several pre-cooked pre implementations that are part of my runtime that are, are loaded already in a class somewhere. But what, whatever it is, that logic actually has to go into the implementation here or, or be external to it somewhere. So there, there's some way where the language runtime, if, it, if need be, can go and change this and, and change the, the method handle that this call site is, is holding at any given time. But that, that again is up to the language runtime. So the, this bootstrap process, the important thing to remember is that this only happens once for every individual call site or for every individual invoke dynamic invocation. So the first time you run it, you have to kind of jump through all these hoops and you're basically doing your linking here. You're figuring out which method you're calling. But once you pay that price, then, then you're done, right? So the idea here is we're, we're amortizing the, the cost of linkage um, to where you know, upfront you pay a high cost you know, to run the bootstrap method and figure out what method we're actually gonna, is actually gonna implement this call. But once you do that, then everything can be you know, very, very quick because it's basically like a static call. And the JVM understands invoke dynamic instructions. It knows how to, you know, it's, it sees the call site, it sees what it's pointing to, and it can just inline everything now because basically the code is kind of speaking the language of the JVM. So again, just, just to reiterate, because this is so important, so the, just the first time it, it's executed, um, the bootstrap method either finds an implementation or maybe it generates an implementation on the fly. It, it's free to do whatever it wants, but it has to come up with some method to actually run. And then it returns a call site with a method handle that points to that whatever it generated or found in step two. And then from then on, every time we run that method, that invoke dynamic instruction will immediately just allow the JVM to jump into what we have. So now we've got something that's very fast and very performant and all this reflection stuff that was a black box to the JVM becomes just a straight through thing that it understands and it knows how to inline and it can give us, give us the performance. So the key here is that linkage is not the same as invocation. Before, with the, with the complicated you know, reflection-based language runtime way of doing things, we kind of had to go through all the, the linkage logic to figure out every single time what method we want to call. And so we paid that cost every time we made that call. With Invoke Dynamic, we pay that cost only once, at the very beginning when the bootstrap class is loaded. And then after that, it's, it's just like a static call um, as far as the JVM is concerned. And we can do things really, really, really fast. So um, that brings us to kind of our, our sort of demo here. And so as I said, we're continuing to find more and more use cases 
for Invoke Dynamic. The, the killer app, so to speak, the original motivation for Invoke Dynamic may have been supporting dynamic languages. But of course, um, we've just come across a whole bunch of other scenarios where the flexibility that Invoke Dynamic gives us um, is, is just basically too good to pass up and it lets us do some nifty things. So my, my first recommendation is to definitely check out um, the Lambda uh, talks that, that Brian Getz has done about, and where he talks about how they chose, they ended up you know, looking at all these different options and eventually settled on using Invoke Dynamic to implement the Lambda expressions in, in JDK 8. It's a fantastic talk and when I designed this talk, I actually designed this talk with the intention of prepping people to watch Brian's talk. So after this, you should understand Invoke Dynamic enough to follow along with his talk and understand um, his reasoning and what he's explaining there. So that's a really great thing and I, I couldn't even begin to do as good a job as he does for that. So I've decided to tackle something much more simpler and easier to understand, um, but also a nifty usage of Invoke Dynamic, and that is the string concatenation from JDK 9. So, you know, string concatenation is, is basically just when you take like, you know, a string like hello plus world, and you, you use the plus, we override the plus operator to concatenate strings in the Java language. And that's really convenient and we do that all the time. That's just basic plain vanilla Java that you learn you know, kind of your first day as a Java programmer or whatever. Um, but that act of concatenating X number of strings um, you know, using the plus sign, there's nothing really that corresponds to that in the bytecode, right? So how does that actually look like when, when we do bytecode on it? Let's actually take a look here. So. I'm really hoping this doesn't just blow up. Um, so I have here, let's look at one example. Um, sorry. Okay, uh, sorry, can people not see? All right. Um, so, we have, is that, there was a, Oh, nice, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> All right. All right. So we're gonna look at string, we're gonna look at a source code here. So this is just, just to start off things. So I'm just taking two strings, code and one, and then concatenating them together. So let's see what, what JDK 8 gives us. Um, I'm really hoping this is JDK 8. Yes, it is, okay. Oh, no, no, it's not. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, this is hopefully JDK. All right, yeah, okay, we're on a roll here. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna compile this, right? And now I'm looking at Java P and verbose, that'll give me the disassembly and I don't think there's any private stuff in here, but I just add that by pure default. So let's look at the bytecode that's actually generated here. And you see that what we're doing is we're calling string builder. So we instantiate a string builder up here, and then we're calling, we're making calls to append. And then we if finally we just do a two string and, and that gives us our result. And, and that works out pretty okay. I mean, that, that's not necessarily ideal, but it's also not necessarily horrible. So let's look at a different example. You can probably guess where I'm gonna go with this. So what if, you know, I'm gonna take 10 strings and concatenate them all together. So, you know, well, what's that gonna look like? Oh yeah. All right, so. And of course I'm forgetting options. So yeah, I mean, every single one of those turns into a call to append. And people that are familiar with String Builder probably know that it, I think it's got like a, a default buffer of like 16 characters. And so behind the scenes while we're doing these appends, we're actually having to you know, get a larger array, copy everything over, and you know, depending on the size of the strings you're appending, that could be very, very wasteful in terms of memory and, and CPU time. So there's a whole bunch of ideas of how we could implement this better. And the idea is that, okay, so, you know, it's probably something that would be going on on the JVM side, but, you know, we're not really sure long-term 
what we want to do to solve this problem. I mean, one thing is just basically it would be nice if we could have just one invocation, right? But if we just have some magic method that could take X number of strings and concatenate them together, you know, what would the signature be like? Aha, that seems like you know, the kind of flexible, the flexibility that invoke dynamic would give us. So let's see what happens with a modern JDK. Not that Java 8 isn't modern. <laughs> So I'm, I think this is a JDK 11 here, yeah. And let's take a look at what, did I? Sorry. So we still have all of our all of our appends here for some reason. Sorry, just one second. That's very odd. Okay, I have no idea why that's happening, but um, Oh, oh, that that's <laughs> super unfortunate. Um, just one second. Actually, so Java C. Oh, shit, I don't have I don't have the modern Java C in here. Um, I'm sorry, I thought I, uh, I've completely hosed this. Um, let's see if I have. Okay, I'm in this one. All right. Let's see if we can blow this up here. I don't suppose you know how to make this bigger. <laughs> Um, settings, here we go. Appearance. That is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I am so sorry about this. All right. All right, so now we've, we've built it with Java 13. I, I really hope that was Java 13. <laughs> <laughs> and now let, let's go take a look at what that looks like. Oh. Oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, you guys are wonderful, all right. <laughs> so um, so we're, we're kind of doing the same thing before where you know, we're, we're taking each individual string, we stick it on the stack, then we stick it into a local variable slot, and then that's kind of a preamble to, to calling to our method call. And then we just kind of load each one of them from the local variable slots, so they're all up on the stack, and then we have one single invoke dynamic call. So we've replaced all those individual, um, all those individual calls to string builder append with one single call right here. And the implementation is completely up to the, the platform. So we might do it in one way, you know, that, that's like using some sort of JVM intrinsic or something in you know, a particular major release, and then in the next major release find out that it's much more efficient to spin by code or, or, or do something like that. But if anything, what we've done is, is we've avoided having to allocate a new object and do a whole bunch of different calls to it. Um, and, and so we have this flexibility now where 
you know, we can delay this. So even if we change how we implement the, this in the future, the byte code doesn't have to change. Before, when you're looking at the different ideas of, of you know, how could we improve this situation, pretty much all of them involved, well, you know, we could do this, but if we change our minds later, people are gonna have to recompile their code with Java C from a later JDK version to get the advantage of that. And we said, no, like it's bad enough that we have to say, okay, to get this advantage, you have to rebuild with JDK 9. You know, we don't wanna have to do that again in the future. So by using Invoke Dynamic, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, so you know, we have some, some semantics here where you know, this Invoke Dynamic call is calling this bootstrap method, and this bootstrap method is what's responsible for returning the call site with the method pointer to an implementation. And today it's one implementation, tomorrow it might be a different implementation, but this bytecode does not need to change. This bytecode can stay static, and it never needs to be recompiled, and now we have the flexibility as the platform implementers to go through later after the fact and change whatever implementation this bootstrap method gives us. So it's, it's a way of branching kind of the, this gap between the language semantics and the, you know, the Java language specification and what bytecode gives us. Um, it was crossing that gap for us with support for dynamic languages um, you know, between all these different arbitrary languages that had their own semantics, but now we're also finding, for even for the Java language, that there's ways where it's, it's coming in handy because it's allowing us to kind of do things, you know, kind of ease the friction between what the language wants to do or what the language allows the programmer to do and what the bytecode um, inherently would natively support. So there, there's all sorts of gaps like that. Lambda expressions was another one where you know, it, we found that doing something um, where we wanted to be able to, to change the implementation under the hood without impacting the bytecode um, that, that people have already compiled um, would be advantageous. And so Lam that was kind of the main reason why um, Brian chose, chose Invoke Dynamic for the implementation for Lambda expressions. Not to like spoil his talk or anything, but. <laughs> um, so anyway, so, so that, that's the, the demo. Um, Thank you so much for, for everyone's help. I, I really appreciate that. So takeaways, um, Invoke Dynamic lets us programmatically alter linkage. So the idea is that we have this way now where we can decide you know, what we're gonna link to at runtime, but only do it once. And then once we do it, everything can be inlined and quick because it's really simple and the JVM kind of understands um, how the, the semantics of, of invoke dynamic and call sites and method point and, and method handles work. You know, so we do it once, we pay that cost up front and then we're done and when we get out of the way and we let the JVM come in and do things very, very quickly. Again, just to reiterate, even if you know, you're not a language implementer or someone that, that's gonna go in and start you know, spinning your own bytecode and using Indy, um, the, the Invoke API is extremely powerful and can maybe give you better performance for a lot of cases that in the past um, have been only possible with the Reflection API. And of course, I just wanna say that the JVM is a fantastic platform for any language, not just Java, and, and we're continuing to, to invest time and effort to, to make sure that that remains the case. So um, just a, uh, in case for, for people that might not have come across the JVM Language Summit before, um, some of the best talks out there about the Java platform are on, at, happen at the JVM Language Summit. And kind of unlike Code 1, all the sessions always get recorded and put up. Um, so you can kind of go through and, and look through all of them. I always spend a, a week or two after every JVM Language Summit just going through YouTube, watching all the videos, and, and they're fantastic. So if you're interested in Invoke Dynamic and, and you know, the, kind of this level of, of stuff at the bytecode level. Um, it's a fantastic resource to learn more. Um, there's also the Linker and Loaders book, which is available um, at least in, in a pre-publication version for free online. Um, that's really great in learning about, about invocation semantics and, and linking and, and stuff like that. And John Rose's blog is also just, just fantastic and full of all sorts of really great information about Lambda forms and, and stuff like that that he's done to make the invocation API quick. Thank you very much. I, I very much appreciate you all showing up to hear me to do this talk. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.